Welcome to the Black Entrepreneur Experience Podcast, inside the business, buzz, and brilliance of Black entrepreneurs. Here is your host, Dr. Francis Richards. The Innovative Thinkers, Episode 117. Thank you for joining us as we elevate the Black Entrepreneur Experience by interviewing CEOs, thought leaders, innovative thinkers, and Black entrepreneurs across the globe. I'm your host, Dr. Francis Richards, and today we have Seth Golden. He's an author with 18 best-selling books, founder of Alt-MBA, entrepreneur, and most of all, a teacher with 30 years of projects. Welcome, Seth. Thank you, Doc. It's a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm so glad you make this podcast. It's a needed gift to the people who are listening. Thank you. And thank you. We're going to jump right into, we're going to call this Break the Ice, and it's some fun facts. So why don't you tell our audience, what was your first job? I was uh, responsible for cleaning the grease off the spiked hot dog wheel at the Carousel Snack Bar in uh, Buffalo, New York, which meant that not only did I stick my head into this thing that was covered with hot dog grease, I had to carry it across the room, and once I dropped it on my head, which really hurt. If you could acquire an instant skill, what would it be? Oh, boy. Well, maybe playing the bass guitar. What book are you reading right now? Uh, I'm just finishing up The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch, a physicist out of the UK. And I am rereading, as I always am, a book called The Art of Possibility by Roz Zander and Ben Zander. Who is someone you really admire? Well, to be completely truthful, I would have to say you, because you are showing up with your full heart when it's not easy to do so, and you're doing it over and over again. Oh, wow. That is so touching. What is your favorite movie? Well, for a long time, it was Buck Rubanza Across the Tenth Dimension, because it's such a bad movie and had a good cast. Uh, I regularly... We watch movies like The Matrix in 2001, Memento. I like sort of quirky science fiction. Hit the treadmill or hit the couch? Oh, I'm a swimmer. I swim every day. Excellent. Thank you for breaking the ice with us. And so I've given our audience a really brief bio about you. Seth, why don't you fill in the blanks and share with us what you'd like us to know about you and your business? Well, uh, my business is to run workshops and help people get through the places that they are stuck. The reason I do that, because I have a lot of choices. I'm very lucky. I was there at the beginning of the internet. I built the first company that did email marketing. I invented permission marketing, sold it to Yahoo. I do this because I believe in this moment, each of us has more freedom than we want to admit, more ability to create value, to be generous, to open doors, to build stuff that people want to pay for. And there's way too much injustice in the world, way too much cultural bias. But the path of the entrepreneur who creates value is one that is open to anybody who can figure out how to find a small group of people and do something that makes their lives better. And if I can help people do that, that's a good day. What are you most grateful for right now in your life? I am well aware that I won the birthday lottery. I had great parents growing up and got the benefit of the doubt in a whole bunch of places where most people wouldn't have gotten the benefit of the doubt. And I don't want to sell that short. I want to figure out how to use that head start to make sure that I'm opening doors for other people. And I'm grateful for it every day. Is there a social cause connected to your business or your brand? We uh, donate a lot of money every year to Charity Water, to Room to Read, to the Acumen Fund. I am mostly focused on helping organizations that are going to people who are truly, desperately in need and giving them tools that go beyond aid and instead help people get into the game of trade, helping people find the devices and the technologies and the education that will help them make a difference. What advice would you give to elevate the experience of the Black entrepreneur? Well, 
I'm going to start by saying I have no idea what it's like to be a black entrepreneur. I know what it's like to be a rejected entrepreneur. I know what it's like to be a failing entrepreneur. I have failed at it uh, longer than most people. And my experience is that we tend to get frustrated and in a corner when we try to serve too many people, when we try to be picked by people in authority, when we try to build something for everyone, because that's when the critics show up. And so my advice is to find the smallest viable audience. And this is what my new book is about. If you can find 500 or 1,000 people that would miss you if you were gone and serve them in a way that so overwhelms them that they have to tell the others, then no one can stop you. And if you can begin with that core, you can repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and scale. And that's the way every important business that we know of was built, every single one. None of them was built to be popular for the masses. All of them were for the specifics, for the niches, for people who desperately needed their problem to get solved. Now, how do you find that tribe, that fan base, that core 500? Yeah, so it's a great question. Let's divide the two concepts in half. First of all, there are already tribes. The tribes are there before you arrive. So there's the tribe of people who identify because they're wearing high fashion. There's the tribe of people who identify because they have the latest sneakers. There's the tribe of people who identify because they're into certain kinds of computer games or video games. They're there before you get there. Now, if you decide to open a store that's going to sell collectible, obscure sneakers, you're not selling them to everyone. You're not selling them to mom and dad. You're not selling them to the kid who needs them for gym class. You're selling them to the people who are already in that tribe. So we show up to serve that group. And so our hard work begins with, do we see them? Do we understand them? Do we know what they want? And then the second part of our work is, how do we send a signal that they can see that lets them know we are there for them? Once you've done that, once you become the clubhouse, then the tribe will adopt you and they will stick with you for as long as you stick with them. Seth, you talked about being in this internet marketing game many, many years. You were a first adopter. So let's fast forward to today. What advice would you give someone that is entering the internet market today? Well, the first advice is ignore advice because most of the advice you're going to get is from people who are following the playbook. And if you follow the playbook, you're just going to be behind the people who've been following it before you. The second thing I would say is to avoid doing Facebook and Twitter the way you're supposed to, because that just makes Facebook and Twitter rich. The alternative is to build a direct connection with a group of people. It can be by email, it can be by SMS, it can be in person, it can be by phone. You own that interaction. You don't have to pay rent for it. If you can build that, if you can start a newsletter, if you can start a circle of people who regularly hear from you, that is worth more than you could ever imagine. That is a huge value bomb. Talk about that aha moment that you knew that you were going to be successful. Oh, has it happened yet? Absolutely. I mean, we can define success any way we want. So by some definitions of my own and others, I was successful from a very, very, very early age. I was healthy and happy, but I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have any employees. So we can decide define success any way we want. I am currently defining success as, do the people who need to be taught, have they learned what I can teach them? And the answer is not even close. I am just getting started. And so I am fueled every day by a, an itch to say, where is the next group of people that I can turn light on for? But in terms of when did I have the hunch that I wasn't going to lose my house? I would say after about 10 years of failing at the book packaging business, I had a few book projects that took years to put together that actually worked. And I looked at that and I said, I think I'm starting to figure this thing out and I don't have to just worry about survival anymore. And that's a good place to be. Talk about your 30 years of projects. I was reading that and it so resonated with me 
about how you defined your career as a project. And I'm going to embrace that because it's absolutely amazing. So we'll talk to our audience about that, your 30 years of projects. Well, you know, in 1950 or 60, the way you were supposed to define your career is I have a job and I will do that job really well and maybe the company will last forever. And maybe I'll switch jobs and maybe that will happen four times. Maybe it will even happen eight times. And each one of those times will be an emergency because I will be without a job until I have a new one. And that's the classic way to think of a career. I have never thought of my career that way and the world has changed at the same time that I've been thinking about it. I view my career as a series of projects, 120 book projects that I sold when I was a book packager, another 300 that I didn't sell. And then the project of starting Yoga Dine and the project of Squidoo and then the brands within those, the project of writing Permission Marketing or the project of Lynchpin, that if you view your life as projects, a whole bunch of things change. First of all, it's easy to overlap them. When you overlap projects, that gives you the ability to never have an emergency because you've got a two-year project you're working on, a one-year project, you've got a project that's going to ship in a couple of weeks. They all layer on top of each other. And that's the way a good chef at home cooks, a home cook, right? You're working on the appetizer at the same time you're boiling the soup, at the same time you're roasting the tofu in the oven, at the same time you're letting the cashews soak for dessert. Each one of those is a project and they all come together at some point and there's a meal. But if one of them breaks, it's okay because you got other things going on. And projects have beginnings and they have middles and they have ends. And there's a point in a project where you ship it. You say, it's ready here. And I love all of those pieces of the project life. I don't really know how to think well about having a job. Have you, um, talk about your latest project. What is your project today? So we started the Alt-MBA about four years ago. It's a 30-day intensive. People from all over the world, 74 countries have taken it. It is online. It takes a month. And what we found is it was changing people's lives more profoundly than anything I'd ever done. And in the last year, we've expanded it by creating lower-cost tactical workshops One on marketing, uh, one on bootstrapping, a new one coming out about freelancing. And each one is on a custom discussion board that we built. And we call them the Akimbo Workshops. You can find out about them at akimbo.com, A-K-I-M-B-O. Akimbo is the word that describes the powerful bend in a river. It's also the look that Wonder Woman has when she puts her hands on her hips. It's called Standing Akimbo. It's power pose. And that's what we're trying to help people do is level up. Oh, I love that. What is your best discovery? Mm, These are delicious questions, my friend. (laughs) Thank Um, you. You know, I think in terms of the value created, my discovering email marketing was a pretty big deal. If you've ever gotten non-spam ethical email from a company, that was my invention. It's not the one that's on most most emotionally connected to, but I think if they write my biography, that will certainly be in chapter one. Seth, advice you wish you had followed? Oh boy, you know, advice is an interesting thing because you usually get it from people who mean well, who want you to do well, and who want you to be safe. And so most of the advice we get is advice to hold back, to wait a little, to do a little bit more research. And I'm mostly glad that I've ignored almost all of that advice. The advice that I've ignored that I wish I had listened to is there are definitely people who have told me this is the moment to go faster. And they were usually right. And this is a special time we live in right now. And this is a good time to go faster. Can you think about that moment that you should have went faster and what prohibited you from moving faster? Well, I can give you a couple of examples. The first one was at the dawn of the internet, AOL, Prodigy, CompuServe, and the World Wide Web showed up. And I still didn't understand how big it was going to be. And then I would say that another time was 
uh, after my company got funded by a real venture capitalist, I was still trying to make a profit because I was acting like a freelancer. And Fred said, you're an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs are supposed to build something bigger than themselves. Go faster. That was hard shift to make. That there's a difference between an entrepreneur and a freelancer, and I think it's worth a minute to describe them. I'm guessing that many of the people who are listening to this are not actually entrepreneurs. They're freelancers. I'm a freelancer. Freelancers get paid when we work. We build things with our own two hands. Entrepreneurs don't get paid when we work. We get paid when we sleep. We build something bigger than ourselves. If we can think of something to be done, we get someone else to do it. And that shift is not easy, but it's real. Oh, wow. That is really profound. So that's going to parlay us into our next question. Which best describes you, entrepreneur, thought leader, or innovative thinker, and why? Definitely not an entrepreneur. There are people who are way better at it than me. Like, I have a couple of projects that I do where I don't do the work myself anymore, but most of the time I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not using other people's money to build an entity. So your other choices were thought leader, and what was the third one? Or innovative thinker. Uh, I'm going to pick innovative thinker because I feel like thought leader has become a cliche for someone who doesn't really have something innovative to say. They're just trying to get on stage so that people will pay attention to them. So count me in as an innovative thinker. Thanks for that. You are such a deep thinker, so that is really profound. What problem exists that you'd like to solve? Getting human beings to stop arguing about politics and start doing something about the fact that the earth is melting. What should we know about your industry that we don't know? Um, So if I have an industry, it's currently the industry of people who, for money, will teach you something. And what I would say is most of the people who are selling education aren't selling something that's very good and they're selling something that costs too much money, that it is possible to take every single course at MIT for free right now, that we don't need to pay money to watch videos. But what we do need is to find the others, to become part of a cohort of people who will challenge each other to go forward. And that's getting overlooked in the race to amuse people by showing them things that are supposed to be called education. Speaking of education, and you talked about free courses at MIT, and we're seeing a shift in the educational model now in terms of a lot of free college, and they're even talking about college being obsolete. What do you think about the future and where that's going? Well, for people who are interested in this, check out StopStealingDreams.com. I have an 18-minute TED Talk there as well as a 50,000-word book for free. My argument is we used to need a building to go to to learn stuff because there was no other place to get the stuff. Now the stuff is not in the building anymore. So if we're going to go to a building, we better have a really good reason. And I think it's a mistake to have education be about tests and certificates. I think education ought to be about solving interesting problems, learning how to lead, connecting with the others, becoming part of something, changing who you are. And if you're not getting that for your kids or yourself in the institution you're in, then I think you should think about leaving. Seth, talk to a younger you. What advice would you give to a younger you? Well, you know, I have failed a lot of times. And It's not easy to fail a lot of times because you got to stay in the game long enough to fail again. And I am glad for every one of them. So I would not tell my younger self to avoid those failures. What I would say is just one simple sentence. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. Continue. And I think we all need to say that to ourselves. Speaking of failures, talk about that worst moment in business and what was your takeaway? Oh, boy. There were a whole bunch of them where I was out of money, out of time, out of respect, out of people to support me, alone, it felt like, with a giant spotlight. Uh, And all you want to do is crawl up in a corner 
and make it go away. There were times when I was ready to go get a job at a bank, which would have been horrible. There were times when I felt like I'd let down many, many people. And that feeling, that cold, raw feeling inside, shifted what I do. It made me far more conservative about the scale of what I built because I don't have it in me to make a promise to a thousand people. I don't have it in me to run a public company because I can't deal with that feeling. So instead, I've made it so I can't go out of business because my scale is small enough. But that lets me be braver and bolder with the actual content of the work I do. Because instead of playing for safe, I'm playing for important. And I was able to do that by insulating myself from going out of business. What's a technology tool or a technology platform that is a must-have for you in managing your business day-to-day, Seth? I'm on Slack a ton. I'm on email more than I should be. I run my blog on WordPress. Uh, there are The tools that I use are available to every single entrepreneur for a total of $50 a month, maybe 100 That's magic. That's never been true before in history. World-class tools available for $10 a day. So, you know, I remember what I used to have to do to wire up my office. I remember the super expensive software we used to use to typeset books and on and on and on. None of that stuff matters anymore. Talk to the person in the audience and they're saying their back is up, up against a wall and they need to launch a business in 30 days and make money, what would you recommend that they do? I think you launch a business in two days and make money. Um, I think the mistake is to think you want to be Elon Musk. Uh, The mistake is to think you need to invent the next post-it. You don't have to be original and you don't have to go big. So for example, if it's Thursday, you could walk down the street to somebody who's got a big old house and say, can I run a yard sale for you on Sunday? Let's get rid of a whole bunch of your stuff. I'll do all the work. We'll split the money. And if you spend three days promoting that, there's no way you're not going to make $1,000 in one day. No way. And then you could do it again next week. And after you've done it six weeks in a row, you could hire someone to do it and keep half of their money. And suddenly you've got a business. The number of problems that people want to solve is very large. The number of people who are bold enough to try to solve them isn't very large at all. And if you can figure out how to sell, if you can figure out how to earn trust in the community, you can figure out how to make a living. Talk about your biggest achievement so far in your business. Um, I think that what we're measuring now is the feedback we get and that we see from the people who have graduated from the Alt-MBA and from our workshops. Uh, Just today, someone posted a note uh, inside the podcasting fellowship that we run. And yesterday, she was stuck. She had been stuck for three years trying to honor the memory of a friend of hers through the podcast she was trying to build. And as a result of an interaction she had in the fellowship, she shipped it today, 24 hours later. And I listened to her five minutes on audio, and I started to cry because it was so beautiful. It was clearly in her long before we came along, but we were able to open that for her. And if I can do that for somebody every once in a while, it makes all the rest of it worth it. What's a daily or a weekly habit that you do consistently that has given you the greatest success? Oh, there's no question that blogging every day is the single best thing I've ever done, and you can do it too. The act of blogging every day, doesn't matter who reads it, means that you thought hard about something you wanted to put your name on and you shared it with the world. And I do that every single day. And how long have you been doing that consistently every day? Way more than 15 years. I haven't counted lately, but I'm 7,000 posts into it. Excellent. We can learn from successful entrepreneurs, peoples, or brand. Tell us a brand or a business that you think is dominating or you admire and why? A brand or a business that's dominating and why? 
I'm looking around the room here, and I'm imagining, I'll pick a couple, Adobe, the people who make Photoshop. Now, there are many alternatives to Photoshop that are way cheaper and easier to learn. So why does Adobe dominate? Simple. People like us do things like this. That expression, people like us do things like this, means if you want to be seen as a high-status designer, you can't show up with a file that's not in PSD format. If you want to be seen as one of us, you got to know how to use our tool. Once they established that Photoshop was the tool for people like us, then they're going to keep dominating until someone comes along with something that's got a technological shift to it. So there's an example. It's not for everyone, but it's a multi-billion dollar company. People like us do things like this. And another example I'll give you is the way that in just 10 years, Tesla became the number one best-selling luxury car in California and in many parts of the world. How could they have done that? How do you defeat Mercedes and Volvo and Lexus and even Cadillac? Well, the answer is pretty simple. The kind of person that spends $80,000 on a car isn't buying a car. What they're buying is a chance to tell their neighbors I have more status than you, and I'm smarter than you. That's what they're buying. And so when the Tesla came along, it said every other car is for stupid people. This car is for smart people. And there was an audience of folks who, the minute the Tesla was introduced, became unhappy because it reshifted what they stood for because they were driving the wrong one. That's a gutsy thing to do. It's not easy to do, but he did it. Tell us a song title that would best describe you or your brand. Oh, Aretha, it's my <laughs> wife's ringtone. Uh, because I think that respect for the people we serve, respect for the environment, respect for the opportunity, that's what I'm trying to do, right? I mean, I could pick Oye Como Va from Santana, but I don't even know what that means. So I'm going to go with respect. Speaking of family, how do you marry your personal life, your family life with your business? Okay, so there are people who talk about work-life balance, and I, I have a lot of trouble with that because your work is what you're doing when you're working, and your life is what you're doing all the time. What we know is you only get 24 hours in a day, so does everyone else, and we know you're going to sleep some amount of time. The question is, where will you draw the line? You will not get ahead by working two more hours than everybody else. Not going to happen. Maybe if you were in the steam shovel business, it would, but no more. So draw a line. And the line is, at this o'clock, I am not going to be at work. So I was a stay-at-home dad for 15 years. For 15 years, I was home every day at 3 o'clock. Draw the line. Get the work done when you need to get the work done. If you do a job that's filled with tasks, hire someone to do those tasks and get back to your work, which is to create value, enough value, that you can hire people to do the tasks. Seth, who are your top two influencers in your life and what lessons did they teach you? It was my mom and my dad. Uh, my mom taught me about respect, about community about being where you are supposed to be. And my dad taught me about making a ruckus, about seeing possibility, and about repaying the community by showing up over and over for them. My dad was on the board of the Baptist Church in Buffalo when I was growing up, which was pretty surprising because he wasn't a religious person. Uh, my mom was the first woman on the board of the Albright Knox Art Museum. And my dad volunteered to run the United Way one year. This is what I thought was normal. I grew up thinking everyone did that. And I have tried to follow in their footsteps as much as I can. If you had to do it all over again, would you do the same business and the same industry? If I was trying to make money or what? Either or. Well, I'm super glad. Failures and all, successes and all about what I ended up with. So if I was doing it all over again, I'd do it all over again. But if you're asking, where is value created in hindsight? It's pretty clear that 
for the last 10 years and for the next 20, value is created by people who create and produce networks. Networks where value exists. So the internet's not called the internet by accident. It's the inter-network, the network of networks. If you figure out how to be the host of the people who need to be connected, you're going to do fine. What are your goals for the future of your brand and your business? Well, you know, I hired a couple of people this year because our goal is to make the Akimbo workshops more effective for more people. And we're not going to do that by lowering our standards. We're going to do that by encouraging our alumni. We have way more than 10,000 of them to tell the others. Because if each of our alumni brings us one more student, we'll double in size. And that's what we're going to do is gradually and thoughtfully make this change happen. That's what we're committed to. Seth, how do you keep your happy during this journey? <laughs> well, Doc, here's the thing. We can define happiness any way we want. People who are frustrated at work right now, if they lived in Kibera or if they lived 200 years ago and they all got off of the job they have today, they'd be over the moon. What, you mean I get to work indoors in a place that's not filled with coal smoke and I don't have to worry about smallpox? Sign me up. It's all relative. And we get to decide what narrative we will tell ourselves. And I shifted my narrative 30 years ago, and I said, I'm only going to get today once. Let's define today as a really good day. Hmm, I like that. Give us three truths that you've learned in life or business so far. Well, if I knew all the lyrics to Hamilton by heart, I could probably be held these truths to be self-evident. I think that Zig was right that you can get anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. I think that Zig was right when he said there's a difference between being a wandering generality and a meaningful specific. And I think I was right when I implored people to make a ruckus. I think we need more ruckus. Hmm. Who are your heroes? So I wrote a blog post a bunch of years ago about heroes and mentors. Mentoring is overrated. Mentoring doesn't scale. Mentoring is a place to hide. It's trapped. I can't mentor anybody. And even if I could mentor five people, I can't mentor enough people. But heroes? Heroes are people you can have by your side even if they don't know it. You can say to yourself, in this moment, what would Gandhi do? Right? In this moment, what would Madam C.J. Walker do? In this moment, what would Steve do? And that idea that someone who's come before us who stood for something, right, the Walt Disneys of the world, what would they do? And so I've got like a whole bookshelf of heroes here, and I just pull the one out that I need in the moment that I need them. And I was lucky enough through my career to meet so many of my heroes, Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. I met Zig and I met Jay Levinson. That's great. And I'm thrilled I did. But even if I hadn't, they'd still be my heroes. Seth, you have put a lot in books. You've written a lot of best-selling books. You have an amazing blog. If someone spent a day with you, what would they learn about you that we have not seen in print? Well, I'm pleased to say that what some people say is that I'm just like I am in print in real life. Um, I write like I talk, and this is it. I'm not putting on a show. Uh, I'm proud of that. But the, I guess the other thing is it is possible to be as productive as I have been without being frazzled. I am not frazzled. I don't think it's necessary to be frazzled. I think if you get rid of all the cruft, you have plenty of time to do a lot of work. One of the challenges that you hear a great deal about individuals wanting to start up, start up lean, and I loved your definition when you talked about being a freelancer versus an entrepreneur one of the big challenges we hear is access to capital. Talk about that and for individuals that are looking to 
finance their business and right. if they're using capital as a potential challenge for not moving forward? And the answer to your last question is yes, of course they are. So I begin with this. Most people who are looking for capital do not really understand what capital is for. Capital is not to pay your expenses. Capital is not to make it easier to become a freelancer. Capital is to, be, is to buy a machine or another asset that actually has value that your competition can't touch. That's what capital is for. So if you're having trouble raising money, it's probably because you're raising money for a lifestyle business. I love lifestyle businesses. I have a lifestyle business, but it doesn't deserve capital because capital is reserved for a very special purpose if someone says i'll give you money if you guarantee your house run away because they're not funding your business they're just stealing your house so with that said i think you begin by saying people like me with my background and my kind of business do any of us ever raise money do we raise a lot of money do we raise money from professionals the answer is no then please invent a business that doesn't need money because you're not going to be able to be the first person of style X for style industry who got the $10 million check. This is not going to happen. And that's why bootstrapping is such a big idea. And we run the bootstrapping workshop. We're running it again in a few weeks. Bootstrapping says, if you can build a business that helps your customers a lot and they trust you, your customers will fund your business. And if your customers fund your business by buying what you sell in advance, then you don't need to raise any capital. So what people don't remember about Richard Branson is the way he founded Virgin Air is he got stranded at a little airport and so were 40 other people. And he made a sign and he walked up and down the airport until he had gotten, I don't know what it was, 20 people to hand him $1,000. Because it was worth $1,000 for each of those people to get out of the airport. And then he took the $20,000, he walked down to the charter desk and chartered a plane for $10,000 and kept the rest. That's bootstrapping, right? He didn't have to go get a venture capitalist to fund it. His customers funded what he built. And if you say, well, but my customers don't care enough about what I'm making to pay me in advance, I would say, make something else. What's working well for you now in your business? Um, I would say two things. One, uh, very carefully over time, I've assembled a group of astonishing people to work with. And Slack makes that even easier because one's in the Philippines and one's in North Carolina. And we have 83 coaches in 30 countries. That's magic. And I would say the second one is Assuming that my customers are smart, caring, generous people, as opposed to assuming the worst. Let's step back, Seth, um, a couple of questions. You mentioned about your bootstrapping um, cohort that's getting ready to start. Tell us more about that. And if someone's interested, how can they um, take advantage of that? Okay, so if you go to boot.work, that's B-O-O-T dot W-O-R-K, it'll explain it. But what the Bootstrappers Workshop is, is 100 days surrounded by other people like you online in a discussion format. And then I made 30 lessons every other day. There's a five or 10 minute video of me explaining one of the principles of bootstrapping. And then there's a project associated with it, a prompt about your work, your customers, what you do. You post your answer to it in this discussion board. And over the course of the workshop, more than 200,000 posts will get posted. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth among all the people who are in the workshop. You will find the others. You will see the others. You will be seen. You will expose your fears. Learn what assets are available to you. And at the end, you will have put together a business plan that makes it so that you can go to people who have money and a problem they want solved, and they will front you that money so that you can go solve their problem. That's what we're trying to help people build. So they should go to boot.work.com? No, just boot.work. Okay. 
glued that work. And on that, is it um, what is the time frame on that? It opens and closes, or how does that right. work? That's, That's right. So it opens on April 9th, and you can sign up until April 15th, and then it runs uh, until the summer. That's a brilliant idea. Thank you. What book would you recommend and why? Okay, so if I'm in the shoes of a new, shiny, eager entrepreneur, I think let's talk about a book called The War of Art by Steve Pressfield. And in that book, Steve will explain why you are stuck and how to get unstuck. So I'll I'll pick that one. Seth, if you conducted this interview, what is the one question that you would have asked yourself and I want you to answer? Oh, boy, you're so sneaky. Um, you know, I think that the entrepreneurs like to think that the big variable is money, but the big variable is time. How will you spend your time? Because we just gave you 12 hours today. We gave me 12 hours today. We gave Richard Branson 12 hours today. Everyone gets 12 hours at work. What are you going to do with it? That's the great leveler because you can use it on behalf of someone else. So I don't know how that turns into a question, but that's my answer. Seth, thank you so much for spending time with us on Black Entrepreneur Experience, the podcast elevating Black entrepreneurs across the globe. Before we conclude, share with our audience the best way for them to connect with you, for them to join your cohorts, and for them to learn and do business with you. Well, thank you. I'm not on Twitter, really, and I'm not on Facebook, really. But you can read my blog every single day at seths.blog, S-E-T-H-S dot blog. And you can find out about these workshops at akimbo.com. I also have a weekly podcast, which you can find at akimbo.link. Thank you, Seth. That is a wrap. You're amazing. What a pleasure. Thank you so much for being a pro. Thank you. Thank you for listening and subscribing to Black Entrepreneur Experience. We would love for you to leave a review and rating on iTunes and share with your friends. For show notes and more episodes, go to www.beepodcast.com. Join us next Wednesday. And remember, green is the new black. So keep your bank accounts and your business in the black.